Okay, I'm going to start. Thank you everyone for joining our cannabis equity workshop today. Uh, my name is Mone Sheikali. I'm a senior planner with the city of Santa Rosa. And uh, my supervisor, Emmy Lard, is also here today. From our consultant team, SCI group, we have Kyle here and John Blees and Tristan Foley. So they will present the workshop today for you. And can we go to the next slide? I have to read the next slide so I can explain about our policies. There you go. Let me move this one so I can read it. So I'm going to read the slide. The city of Santa Rosa is committed to create a safe and inclusive environment free from disruption. We will not tolerate any hateful speech or actions and are well staffed to, to monitor and are Oh my God, okay. And are well staffed to monitor that everyone is participating respectfully or they will be removed. If necessary, we will also immediately end the meeting. If the meeting is ended, we will plan on recording another presentation without particip participants that will be posted on the project website. Also, today's meeting is being recorded. So I will give it to Carl from here. Carl, you can go over the presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you, Monet, and good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us tonight to discuss cannabis social equity here in the city of Santa Rosa. Uh, so my name is Kyle Tankard. I'm a senior consultant and cannabis policy leader with SCI Consulting Group, and I will be leading tonight's discussion. Uh, so for, for those of you who are not familiar with SCI, SCI is a public finance and urban economic consultant firm based out of Fairfield, California, with over 35 years of expertise in, in assisting public agencies here in California with policy, planning, and cannabis-related services. Uh, so in collaboration with the city of Santa Rosa, we have been working on a draft cannabis equity assessment that will inform the city's development of a local uh, equity program here in the city of Santa Rosa. Uh, so for tonight's meeting, we want to both educate the community about cannabis equity and the assessment that we are conducting, as well as gain insight about the community um, opportunities and challenges of developing a cannabis equity program. Uh, so over the past four months, we have uh, reviewed the current cannabis landscape in Santa Rosa analyzed historical cannabis arrest rates and demographic, demographic information to incorporate these findings into an equity assessment. Uh, so tonight I will share with you the top line findings from the assessment. And then from there, we'll discuss the common barriers to entry into the cannabis industry and discuss ways we can develop and structure the barriers to entry. Uh, excuse me. Uh, structure this the city's equity program in order to reduce and eliminate those barriers for uh, disproportionately impacted individuals in the city of C Santa Rosa. And then lastly, uh, we will open uh, up the meeting for a Q&A session at the end to get the community's input and feedback on developing the city's equity program. So what is the goal of social equity in the cannabis industry? Uh, the, the cannabis prohibition era and criminalization has had a devastating impact on populations and communities across California, including here in Santa Rosa. Uh, during this era, and even still today, the burdens of arrests and convictions have fell disproportionately on people of color. Um, the the long-term consequences of cannabis enforcement coupled with generational poverty, education gaps, and additional barriers to entry make it very difficult for affected individuals to enter the regulated cannabis industry. Um, so our goal for the city of Santa Rosa is to advance economic justice uh, for populations and communities harmed by cannabis prohibition and enforcement by promoting equitable access, ownership, and employment opportunities in the cannabis industry in order to dis 
decrease disparities in life outcomes for these impacted communities and to address the disproportionate impacts on the war on drugs in these communities. Um, so in 2018, the state passed the California Cannabis Equity Act, which provides grant funding for local jurisdictions for the development and implementation of local equity programs. Uh, so in 2022, uh, local jurisdictions, uh, I'm sorry, in 2022, the city of Santa Rosa was awarded a grant to uh, conduct a social equity assessment and to develop a local equity program. Um, so by conducting this study and establishing a local equity program, the city hopes to position itself to secure additional grant funding from the state to provide a variety of services and programs uh, to equity applicants uh, to provide access to capital, technical support, and regula regulatory compliance that individuals need in order to access the regulated industry. Um, so very quickly, I'll just kind of go over our scope of the work with the city and the development process um, in developing a local cannabis equity program. So we broke it down into four main steps, and they are outreach and education, cannabis, cannabis equity assessment, program, and, program development, and then program implementation. Um, so steps one and two, the equity assessment and outreach and education really go hand in hand to get together um, in order to provide recommendations regarding policy options for the development and implementation of a local equity program here in the city of Santa Rosa that enhances and improves equ equitable access and ensures diversity in and inclusion in the cannabis industry. Um, so step one of the development process really begins with outreach and education. Um, in recent years, cities and counties throughout the state have proposed and implemented various social equity programs with a shared objective of addressing the longstanding disparities in the cannabis industry. However, what we notice is that many of these programs have encountered obstacles along, along the way um, primarily due to inadequate targeting of outreach and insufficient inclusion and engagement of affected communities during the initial stages of program development. Um, so as a result, a significant amount of time and effort will be dedicated to conducting extensive outreach as a part of this process. Um, so several months ago, we uh, initiated a online community-wide survey to kickstart this endeavor, um, which is still open for participation. So if, if you haven't already, I strongly encourage you all to take that survey. Um, additionally, the next phase of our outreach process involves hosting community meetings like the one happening tonight. And then finally, um, the concluding phase entails conducting individual interviews with various stakeholders from the city of Santa Rosa. Um, ultimately, the feedback and the input we receive will inform our equity assessment and guide the formulation of our policy recommendations. Um, so your active participation, your insights are crucial to um, shaping the future, future direction of this initiative. Uh, so the city has established a dedicated cannabis equity landing page on its website uh, to, to ensure that the community stays well informed. Uh, so this page contains details about the ongoing equity assessment that we're conducting and also provides links uh, to access the survey in both English and Spanish. Um, further, furthermore, following the Conclusion of this meeting, a video recording along with this slide deck will be made available for viewing. Uh, so I strongly urge everyone to visit the city's webpage um, and again, per participate in that online survey. And then to, to keep the public informed throughout this process, uh, the city will be uh, cons consistently providing updates via the, via the website 
uh, this, the city's newsletter and email blast notifications. Um, and by, by, util, by utilizing these channels, uh, we, we aim to maintain open lines of communication and to, to ensure that everyone is kept up to date as we progress forward. Okay, and so in conjunction with our outreach efforts, as I mentioned, we are currently working on preparing a written cannabis equity assessment report. And the primary objective of this assessment is to examine the historical consequences of cannabis related policies and illegalization on communities and populations within the city of Santa Rosa. Um, so by analyzing police statistics, demographics, poverty rates, and other relevant factors, the equity assessment will seek to identify the communities and the populations that have been disproportionately affected and also explore the common barriers that uh, these populations face when attempting to enter the cannabis industry. And then ultimately, uh, the assessment will provide valuable policy recommendations uh, to, to guide the city in establishing a local equity program. So very quickly here, um, this graphic on this slide illustrates our analysis process uh, for the equity assessment. So we begin by identifying disparities related to cannab cannabis related policies and legalization. Um, we then map areas where uh, cannabis related ar arrests and enforcement activities have been con concentrated within the city. Um, from there, we overlay a map highlighting um, various demographic factors such as low income, minority populations within the city. Finally, we take all this data, overlay the arrest hotspots and demographic data onto one single map. And this allows us to identify the specific communities that have been impacted by both cannabis related arrests and socioeconomic challenges. And by following this analysis a process, uh, we, we can gain a compre comprehensive understanding of the communities most affected by cannabis-related policies, enabling us to develop strategies to um, address their needs and promote equity. So Santa Rosa is a di diverse city with a multicultural population population. Uh, so the largest um, ethnic group in the city is white or Caucasian, uh, comprising of a substantial portion of the residents at 62.3%. Uh, the Hispanic Latino population in Santa Rosa is also very significant, accounting for 34% of the city's total population. And then additionally, while relatively smaller in size compared to other racial and ethnic groups, the Asian and Afri African American populations uh, contribute to the city's diversity, representing 5.9% and 2% of the population, respectively. Uh, so in our analysis, we began by examining the historical cannabis-related arrests in the city of Santa Rosa, spanning the period from uh, 2004 to 2023. Um, so throughout this time frame, a total of 4,781 cannabis-related arrests were recorded citywide. Um, notably, the highest number of arrests occurred in 2010, uh, with a total of 16, or I'm sorry, 613 arrests reported. Um, however, following the passage of Prop Proposition 64 in 2016, which legalized and decriminalized recreational cannabis use, uh, there has been a significant, significant decline in arrests. And this decline can be attributed to the changes in cannabis laws, reflecting also a, a shift in um, the enforcement approach towards uh, cannabis-related offenses within, within the city, um, which is a common trend that we, we have seen across the state. So to assess the disparities in the 
uh, in the cannabis related arrests across different demographics within the city of Santa Rosa, we compared the percentage of arrests to the total population of each demographic group. Uh, the data reveals that um, Afri African American individuals experienced a disproportionately higher rate of arrests compared to their representation in the city's population. Um, although they, they only constitute for 2% of the city's um, population, they accounted for 9% of the cannabis-related arrests, which is more than four times their population percentage. Um, in contrast, looking at the other uh, demographic groups, they were arrested at rates more in line with uh, their representation in the population, indicating a relatively proportional distribution. Um, so that really this discrepancy highlights the need to address the di disproportionate impact that cannabis re related arrests have had on um, African American communities within the city, as well as other communities um, throughout the city. Um, so as I previous, previously mentioned, uh, the, the primary goal of the equity assessment is to identify communities in the city that have historically borne the, the brunt of cannabis criminalization. Uh, so through the analysis of the historical ca cannabis related arrest statistics, um, it's become evident that minority populations, particularly African American populations, have experienced a disproportionate rate of arrests. And these arrests have far reaching consequences, limited individuals' opportunities for employment, education, and things like housing. And this systemic impact combined with the uh, significant financial barriers within the cannabis industry uh, creates a formidable obstacle for uh, impacted individuals seeking to en enter the regulated market. Um, so to identify the communities uh, that have been disproportionately affected, we employed three uh, key indicators at a census block level, um, minority populations, low-income populations, and educational attainment levels. Um, so min minority populations, as we saw in the previous slides, are more likely to face uh, cannabis-related arrests, while low-income populations encounter uh, significant barriers due to financial constraints. Um, educational attainment levels also play a crucial role as individuals with lower levels of education may lack the resources needed to successfully enter the industry. Um, so by examining these three ind indicators alongside uh, the location and con concentration of cannabis-related arrests, uh, we hope to gain a comp comprehensive understanding of the, the communities that have borne a uh, disproportionate burden as a result of cannabis uh, criminalization. Um, so on the next three slides, we'll share uh, the results of our GIS analysis. Um, so this first map here shows the minority uh, populations within the cities. Um, so the darker colors on this map represent a higher percentage of uh, minority individuals. And the green dots on the map show where uh, the cannabis arrests took place in the city. Um, so you can see the majority of the arrests are concentrated on the western side of the city. And there's a, a correlation with um, uh, higher minority populations in that portion of the city. So you see the on the eastern side of the city where it's lighter in yellow, those are areas with less minorities. And you can see that there were um, less concentrations of arrests in these areas. Uh, similarly, on this ne next uh, map, which shows the uh, low-income populations, again, the arrests are concentrated in areas of the city where there are a higher percentage of low-income populations. And then lastly, um, this map here shows uh, educational attainment uh, levels 
in the city. Um, so the darker areas on the map show individuals who are over the age of 25 who, who have not received um, their high school diploma. Uh, so again, there's a strong correlation to where these arrests are taking place in areas where um, there are lower educational attainment levels. Uh, so next, I would like to um, highlight some of the um, top barriers um, equity applicants face when trying to enter the regulated cannabis industry. Uh, so in order to enhance and improve equitable access and ensure diversity and inclusion in the cannabis industry, uh, the city's program must reduce and eliminate these barriers. Um, so the barriers that we've identified can be summarized into the following categories, financial, technical, uh, criminal, and other. Uh, so final financial barriers such as access to capital and financing, access to real estate, in addition to the high fees and taxes are one of the most significant op obstacles. Um, contributing to this are past criminal histories, um, which also present financial challenges for individuals due to their inability to access financing, loans, or even signing the lease uh, for a location to operate. Um, next, technical barriers, um, such as the lack of general business skills, ownership expertise, and industry knowledge needed to operate and run a cannabis business uh, also remains a big problem. Uh, when you layer this techn technical knowledge gap of knowing how to run a business, and learning the industry-specific best practices on top of the cannabis legal and regulatory complexities of both the state and local governments, the problem is just exasperated. And then lastly, uh, the transition from an illicit, uh, from the illicit to the regulated uh, legal cannabis market is often hampered by distrust in government especially for those who have been uh, victimized by cannabis enforcement and by those enforcing uh, government laws. Um, so really restoring trust between disproportionately affected communities and the government um, is essential to the success and the effectiveness and overall participation in, the, in, a, in a local equity program. So what can the city do to help individuals overcome these barriers to entry in order to level the playing field for um, disadvantaged individuals? Um, so from our analysis of the common barriers to entry and also the uh, successes and failures of the equity programs est established elsewhere in the state, uh, we've prepared a list of potential program services and benefits uh, that the city um, is evaluating in order to address the financial, technical, and knowledge-based barriers. Um, so financial assistance will play a pivotal role in supporting uh, the success of ec equity applicants. Um, as part of our recommendations, um, the city could establish a loan and or a grant program uh, these programs can serve as valuable resources to equity applicants, um, providing them with the necessary financial support to overcome the barriers they face in entering the regulated cannabis industry. Um, loan programs um, can offer zero interest or low interest loans or even micro loans that enable equity applicants to access capital for startup costs licensing fees, and other expenses associated with entering the industry. And then on the other hand, grant programs can provide a non-repayable fund to assist equity applicants, uh, partic particularly those from mar marginalized communities, um, to help them establish and sustain their canvas business. Um, so in addition to the loan and grant programs, uh, the city could establish a comprehensive 
technical assistance program. Uh, so this program would aim to provide a wide range of business development services, industry specific training and legal support ta tailored specifically uh, for equity applicants. Uh, the goals, the goal of these types of programs is to equip applicants with the necessary training, knowledge, and resources to success, successfully launch and operate their cannabis businesses. Uh, so the technical assistance program could offer a developed curriculum and a training program that covers essential aspects of starting and managing a business within the cannabis industry. So this may include topics such as business planning, uh, financial management, marketing and branding, compliance with regulation, and operational best practices. Um, so by providing comprehensive training, um, hopefully equity applicants are able to uh, gain the skills and the expertise required to uh, navigate the complexities of the industry. And then furthermore, uh, the program can e extend beyond initial training and offer ongoing support to uh, ensure the long-term success of these business. Um, so this support may include mentor mentorship programs with existing operators, uh, networking opportunities, access to industry experts, and legal assistance to address any specific challenges or concerns that equity applicants may encounter throughout their journey. Um, increase in business ownership is, you know, one key outcome for equity programs, but developing a robust, robust uh, workforce um, development program is also crucial in ensuring that um, businesses within the cannabis industry, cannabis industry have access to skilled and local employees. Um, addressing the lack of training for high quality, well-paying jobs is really essential, um, particularly for um, disadvantaged individuals who uh, may face limited opportunities uh, compared to others. Um, to facilitate the entry of it, individuals into the cannabis industry, um, the establishment of training programs really becomes essential. Um, these programs should be designed to equip individuals with the necessary skills and knowledge um, to succeed in various roles within the industry. Um, so this can include job specific training, uh, professional development, and opportunities uh, for hands-on experience. Um, so by focusing on workforce development and creating equitable employment opportunities, the city can foster a more inclusive and thriving cannabis industry while simultaneously addressing uh, systemic uh, barriers that have pre prevented certain communities and individuals from accessing meaningful and well compensated employment opportunities. And then lastly, ongoing outreach, education, and awareness campaigns to support the city's equity program, in addition to developing programs such as record expungement, um, will be very important to uh, the success of the city's program. Um, so definitely at the end of my presentation, uh, we would love to get your input and feedback on what strategies that you think would be most effective in the city of Santa Rosa in order to address these issues of equity regarding the cannabis industry. So now let's delve into our final topic for tonight's discussion, uh, the eligibility criteria for equity, equity applicants. So the eligibility criteria will determine who is able to gain access and participate in the city's equity program. Um, it's really crucial to approach the establishment of these criteria with care and thoughtfulness. Um, again, the primary objective should be to prioritize and serve the communities and populations 
uh, that have been disproportionately impacted by cannabis enforcement. Um, so to ensure the effect, effectiveness of the eligibility criteria, it, it must be well-structured and clearly defined. Um, the aim is to encompass the majority of individuals who have been adversely affected by the war on drugs and really striking the right balance is essential because a, a, a narrow defini definition may inadvertently exclude deserving individuals while a broad definition might allow individuals who might need the, might not need the assistance to per participate and benefit from the program. Um, so here are some key uh, criteria to consider. Um, so individuals or immediate family members with a prior conviction history, um, should there be a low income status associated with the eligibility criteria? Uh, should there be a residency criteria? Should, so should the, the city's program be limited to individuals who have previously or currently are a resident of the city or of Santa Rosa, or should it be limited further to certain communities or areas within the city? And then next is ownership. Um, so this um, should equity applicants be required to maintain a certain percentage of business ownership. And then lastly is eligibility tiers. Um, so should the city develops certain tiers of eligibility in order to pr prioritize the most impacted uh, communities and individuals for the city's program. Uh, so in conclusion, um, let's discuss our upcoming next steps before um, I open this discussion up to the public. Um, so in the following month, our focus will be conducting one-on-one -on -one stakeholder interviews. Um, so we're currently working with the city and we're in the process of compiling a list of stakeholders. Um, so please let city staff know if um, that's something you're interested in participating in. Um, once the stakeholder interviews are completed, our aim is to finalize the equity assessment report by the end of August. Um, so this report will consolidate the findings, our recommendations, and uh, key insights gathered throughout the assessment process. Um, we appreciate your involvement and uh, commitment to uh, the city's effort to develop a, a local cannabis e equity program. And I believe together that um, we can drive positive change and help to promote um, equity in the cannabis industry uh, within the city of Santa Rosa. Uh, so at this time, um, I would like to open this, the discussion up for public input. Um, so as I previously mentioned, um, your input is very important to the, uh, is in a very important part to this process. Um, so we definitely encourage you to ask questions, provide your personal experiences, your input and your feedback. Um, so there are several, several ways you can participate. Um, so if you would like to speak, um, you can please, if you um, click on the hand icon at the bottom of your screen, and then once we see that your hand is raised, um, staff behind the scenes uh, will grant you access to unmute your mic and ask your question. Um, if you're not comfortable with speaking, that's okay. Um, you can either type in a question or provide feedback by clicking on either the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen or by using uh, the chat icon. Um, so to get this discuss discussion going, um, here are a few items uh, we would like to get feedback on. Uh, so what, what do you think are some of the biggest barriers to entry facing uh, Santa Rosa residents? Um, what are some of the vital components that are needed for the implementation of a successful equity program here in the city of Santa Rosa? What type of assistance or program benefits would be most beneficial to equity applicants? Um, what do you think are some of the qualifying eligibility criteria for um, applicants that should take priority in receiving equity assistance? And then are there any improvements that could be made? to the city's existing 
cannabis regula regulatory program, their regulations, licensing process, or um, zoning code. So if you have any questions, please ask them now. Kyle, I've gone ahead and unmuted the microphone for Christina, who has her hands raised. So Christina, okay, perfect. go ahead and use that uh, feature. Hey, can you hear me? We can. I apologize. Uh, this is Moses and Christina here at Africali Culture. I had to, we had to log in on the same computer. But uh, I just wanted to say, like, Kyle, I appreciate you, you doing the, uh, the study on, on the city. You know, and you were dead on as far as a lot of things I heard, but I still feel like as first criteria based on your discovery in in in, in the blacks and the brown people in, in, in the minority populations here that we should be first in that criteria. You see what I'm saying? Because that has nothing to do with black people or like, yeah. you know, and, and I have family members that have gone through arrests and different things as such you know my my uh, little brother did 10 years you know what i'm saying over some stuff mm -hmm. so it's just for me for to not have that be the first thing in the criteria and especially after you did such a beautiful presentation on the imbalance of sonoma county you see what i'm saying yes and and so Moses, if, is if i understand you correctly what you're saying is you know Due to the arrest disparities, why aren't um, black individuals allowed access to the program first? Is that is that kind of what you're hinting at? Yeah, I'm just saying based because based on your discovery and the imbalance and and how that the arrests of of black black men, you see what I'm saying, and women mm -hmm. in Sonoma County, I think we should definitely have a first hand at it. And so should, I know a lot of brown people too that have experienced the same, you know? Yes, yeah, so so unfortunately state and federal law pro prohibits, you know, cities and counties and the, even the state from um, developing um, access to programs that is based on race. So that is why the cri criteria um, you know, most likely we'll focus on individuals who have past criminalization related um, uh, to, to cannabis arrests um, and also include other factors such as um, a, a low income status and be limited to individuals from the city of Santa Rosa. But, but I mean, shouldn't, based on your findings though, you don't think that black people deserve that option to be the criteria in that list, because that's not even on that list, not even first. You know I mean, at, yeah, like, to at least be one of the criteria know. that way we are first and being given that, being that we have been arrested the most. We have been, you see what I'm saying? We are in a position where equity is really a thing that we need to remedy this racial imbalance we have in America. Do you see what I'm saying? And yes, I, this was my biggest fear in which I've talked to the mayor. I've talked to different people throughout the town in terms of it is important to recognize the racial imbalance of this town and do that justice and, and do our job in terms of remedying that. You see, I'm not saying white people don't deserve equity, but I think racial equity has always been the reason why we got to this point at first, right? Exactly. And so it's you know, important that we are in that criteria. You see yes. I mean? And and as I mentioned previously, federal and state law prohibits developing a criteria for access to a program that is based on race. Mm. And, wow. and so so that is why equity programs up and down the state do not include race. And so what we are trying to capture when we develop the el eligibility criteria is is so that we include the African American population and other communities and populations within Santa Rosa that have been um, impacted. Mm. Well, I appreciate that. I guess, I guess, uh, yeah, I hear what you said. And Moses, I would love to uh, talk to you further. So if, if you are interested in 
participate in, in the one-on-one -on -one stakeholders uh, interviews, I think you're a perfect candidate. Um, um, so I believe I already have your contact information from the city. So um, I will reach out to you. Oh, you're welcome to reach out anytime, man. I appreciate you. All right. Thank you, Moses. Okay, thank you, Kyle. The next person I'm going to allow to speak, we have a Sam De La Paz. Okay. Yes, hello. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm unfortunately, if you can go to the next caller and I'll raise my hand again, but I'm about to go through the only, sorry. Thank you, of course. Manny Rivera, you have given uh, you've been given permission to speak. I think he's on YouTube. Manny, are you able to unmute yourself? If not, that's okay. We'll just go to the next uh, person who has their hand raised and that's gonna be Lisa. I've gone ahead and given you permissions to unmute your microphone. Hi, yes, thank you so much for allowing us to speak. Um, I really appreciate the presentation. Um, I'm a executive member of the Hessel Farmers Grange and I'm a consultant for uh, farmers throughout California have been helping them with grant money. Um, and you guys have a really special jurisdiction uh, with the types of um, applicants you will be getting. Um, so in my experience uh, with the equity programs throughout California, um, direct grants have been uh, the ones that have had the highest impact for um, individuals both trying to enter into the marketplace but also um, businesses that are currently in the marketplace but struggling people who have put you know second mortgages on their house and um, just really struggled to get their taxes paid and to um, become compliant um, more so than um, loans even um, low uh, interest rate loans are incredibly difficult for people to stomach taking out when they already are hundreds of thousands of dollars into debt, um, just trying to uh, become legal. <clears throat> um, additionally, um, a lot of your uh, folks that work in Santa Rosa actually live outside city limits. Um, so it would be great if people whose businesses reside within Santa Rosa could also um, access this grant money as opposed to people who just live inside the city limits. Um, and uh, please reach out to uh, the Hessel Farmers Grange. We have um, a lot of uh, farmers and applicants um, throughout the county and state who have worked um, incredibly diligently with um, other jurisdictions on their grant program. We'd love to um, be a resource for you folks. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Okay, the next person I will go ahead and allow to unmute their microphone is Abrea. We can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, so my questions were, um, where can we find out um, how to access these resources? Like, is it one website or is it a multiple different places that we should go? Yes, so the, the city has developed a landing page on their website where they're put in um, information about the equity assessment that we're conducting. Um, in addition, um, there's links to the survey that's live right now in both English and Spanish. And then uh, the recordings from this presentation and the slide deck will also be uploaded there. So anytime there's updates, the city will update that page. Um, so Monet, can you um, actually copy the link and put that in the chat? Oh, that'd be perfect, thank you. And um, all that information will be on this landing page on the city's website? That's correct. And that's the best way to like stay stay up to date. And then I would say, is there any is there anything that um, you could you would recommend for someone to to continue to help advocate 
for these resources? Like what could they do? What could one do? Um, that's, you know, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think as the city moves through, through this process um, and looks to actually develop and implement their program, I think support at, um, you know, future public meetings, um, making your voice heard at future council meetings regarding this topic is definitely a forum to provide your um, support for uh, the city's equity program. If I can just add on to that, um, I see there's some notes in the chat too about the county's program. So as Kyle mentioned, we're just doing the type one grant right now, which is just the assessment. And then there will be a question on whether we apply for the type two grant. Um, but we have had conversations with the County of Sonoma and potential partnership with them. So if we do get grant money that they would be able to facilitate that for us. So we're um, looking at those types of partnerships and watching their program very closely. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and move on to Manny. Manny, uh, you should be able to unmute your microphone and uh, state your questions or comments. Yeah, can you guys hear me? We can. Okay, great. Sorry about that. I was my settings were off earlier, um, but I got I got on here. Um, quick question. So, have you guys identified? So, my name is Manny Rivera. I'm I'm a current licensee. I hold um, a distribution license in Santa Rosa, and uh, I also have a, a, a small cottage indoor cultivation as well as uh, outdoor cultivation um, in Lake County. Um, also in the process of working on trying to open a retail location. I've been uh, basically paying rent on an empty building for the last three years. Um, the process to uh, obtain my construction permits has been extremely easily and difficult. Um, and uh, I'm just wondering, based on um, these programs, because for me personally, being um, first generation Mexican American, I've also been impacted by the war on drugs. In that uh, I did have the city of Santa Rosa uh, a few years ago uh, take my doors in for a cannabis cultivation, um, which caused an immense amount of difficulty in my life. Uh, both that. Um, traumatic experience. Um, I'm just wondering, do you guys have specific zones? Because I know the state looks at specific areas in cities, geographically speaking, that are already identified as uh, highly impacted by the war on drugs and by other um, issues. I know, for example, Roseland is one of those areas. Um, have you guys looked at um, including those areas as the criteria for some of these grants? Um, yes. So, you know, as I mentioned, you know, currently we're further in the analysis, you know, I showed three maps during my presentation of where, you know, cannabis, the highest concentrations of cannabis arrests um, occurred, you know, overlaid, you know, on areas within the city that have the highest minority populations, uh, the highest low income areas and the lowest educational attainment levels. Um, so as the city develops their eligibility criteria for, for the program, they'll have to decide whether the program is um, narrowly defined in that, you know, individuals for, from certain portions or locations or areas within the city that are considered to be the most impacted, those individuals who currently live, live there or have lived there are able to get access or whether the, the program is a little more broad than that and it you know, limits access to individuals um, who are currently living in Santa Rosa or have previously lived in Santa Rosa. Okay, so that all that stuff you're still trying to figure out basically. Exactly, so that will come in okay. the later phase as Amy said, as they work, um, work to decide whether to develop and implement that program and whether there there will be some coordination with the county of Sonoma. Okay, and then are you guys um, have you guys taken any input by any current licensees in regards to some of the hardships and some of the experiences that we've had 
um, over the last few years in regards to, you know, just the taxation by the city, by the county, by the state, uh, you know, um, regulatory bodies and stuff like that. So we have uh, sent an email blast with the online survey um, to all uh, current and prospective um, cannabis operators operating within the city. And then, as I mentioned, uh, we're looking for interest, interest, interested individuals who uh, would like to sit down and do that one-on-one -on -one stakeholder. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, um, definitely please uh, provide the city with your contact information and we'll, we'll set up a time to um, talk about that because that's yeah. definitely... Yeah, definitely I, would, I, would love, I would love to do that. One of the major uh, and biggest hurdles that I experienced personally is you know, coming from a um, um, first generation Mexican American uh, uh, background, my parents were immigrants, you know, we don't have a lot of information in regards to how to navigate those application processes. Um, we don't have a lot of um, um, knowledge in regards to how corporate um, structures work. And, uh, you know, if there was um, some allocation of funds to have a city fund, like some sort of legal um, council or some sort of legal, um, uh, you know, uh, representation where people could ask questions in regards to simply how to get those applications filled in, um, aside from all the other, you know, uh, hardships and difficulties. But that for me was in the very beginning, uh, a, a big, huge curve. And um, yeah, I made a lot of mistakes. It, uh, you know, it cost me a lot of time and money and, um, it would be really helpful to have something like that funded by the, by the city um, so that people who, um, you know, don't have access to that right away or maybe don't even know where to start could have some sort of a starting point because that's, that's extremely difficult for a lot of people. Um, and and that, that's just, uh, you know, based on, uh, on background. You know, a lot of people have that uh, information handed down by their parents or grandparents, but a lot of people in um, certain uh, minority communities, we don't have access to that information. So um, I'd encourage you to look at that and consider that uh, for these types of programs. Absolutely. And, you know, as I, you know, mentioned in my presentation, you know, cities like San Francisco, Oakland, and LA, they're de developing these robust technical assistance programs that teach individuals about business development and the skills that they will need to operate a business as well as teaching them about the industry and you know really these programs should um, prepare individuals um, about the cannabis industry and what they're getting into what they're investing into so that they're able to make a decision whether to enter the industry or not and then also provide the resources such as application assistance and uh, pro, pro bono uh, legal services um, to help equity applicants navigate the application process and um, succeed in opening up their business. So I yeah, completely and then, agree and then, with you. And one other thing too, possibly um, just because it seems like, you know, anybody who's in that position um, to be able to apply for these equity programs, um, one of the things that you could also consider perhaps creating a system or a program where um, anybody who comes through these programs and gets granted or accepted, maybe if there is a way to, to fast track or speed up their application process, that would be extremely helpful because okay. a lot of people, um, we've, we've put basically our entire life savings on the line. And now as you're seeing what's going on in the state, we have, uh, as of this year, 30% of licensees did not even um, renew their cultivation licenses. So you know, it's pretty much guaranteed that those 30% of those people have completely failed uh, in a system that uh, was not really designed for anybody to succeed. Um, and, um, you know, it's really sad um, for somebody who, uh, you know, picks themselves up from their bootstraps, per se, and goes into these processes, um, you know, trying to uh, pursue a dream and then um, doesn't make it out on the other side. Um, due to um, over-regulation, uh, taxation, and um, all the other, uh, you know, setbacks in regards to just what comes along with, um, with legalization, you know, of something like cannabis, um, just because it's, it's, it's been so difficult to navigate, you know, when, when uh, 
the DCC first rolled out all of their, um, uh, what do you call that? Um, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, regulations. Um, there was like seven different um, uh, um, entities that we had to communicate with and they weren't yeah. communicating with each other either. So it was extremely difficult to get any answers. It's getting a little bit better, but it's uh, it's still like a work in progress. Like they're still, they still haven't really figured out how to be efficient, you know? And, you know, everybody says, hey, hang in there guys. Like everything's gonna, it looks like it's gonna be okay. But it's like, you know, uh, the majority of us are like hanging by a thread. Like we may or may not have, you know, three months uh, or six months or even a year. Um, you know, so I really appreciate that you guys are looking at this. Uh, I know a lot of us have been asking for these programs for a long time, um, but, you know, time is really of the essence. You know, some of the people that are still in there are not going to be here in a year. Um, Absolutely. And it'll, it'll be extremely difficult to come back from that, you know, just uh, just in terms of, um, you know, being motivated or, or uh, you know, wanting to, to come back from it. It's been, it's been somewhat traumatic for, for all of us. So um, anyways, um, th that's all I got to say. I really appreciate um, you guys holding this call for us and I'd love to give my input. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll figure out a way to reach out to you guys. Okay. Thank you, Manny. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our next um, person who will be able to pose their comment or question is Sam De La Paz. I have given you permission to unmute, unmute your microphone. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? We can. Great. Um, I just posted some comments in the chat. I'm actually one minute late officially for a dentist appointment for my son. So I've got to go in. But uh, my name is Sam De La Paz. I'm vice president of the Hessel Farmers Grange. Um, was uh, was the interim president for a short time for Sonoma County Cannabis Alliance, um, and I've been an avid advocate in the state of California for um, small legacy farmers and and equity um, in cannabis. And I just want to state um, and really emphasize many of the comments that were made by previous speakers Moses, Lisa, and Manny. Although I know that. The dormant commerce clause prevents us, you know, and other, you know, other legality issues prevent us from prioritizing uh, race or skin color. I think there are creative ways, especially based on on uh, uh, based on arrest history or family arrest history, that we can prioritize these populations that have been impacted by the drug war. I would also like to emphasize that. Um, Although we have the statistics on the black community, which I think is amazing and I really appreciate the presentation. I just want to say that I think it was extremely thorough. It's one of the best I've seen and heard to date in cannabis. So really serious congrats on that um, and, and appreciation for that. Um, really taking a meaningful approach is so, so incredibly important. But I will say that I think we're going to have a hard time getting uh, hard numbers on the Latino and Hispanic populations due to the fact that maybe they they were, I, I can say for sure, they were largely harassed, not always arrested as essential workers and farm workers. Um, I'm sure that law enforcement had a, had a decentivized, um, you know, uh, were maybe dis decentivized to arrest, but not necessarily to harass or further impede um, their, their growth and generational wealth building as far as the population is concerned. So I think that this needs to be looked at very carefully. Um, I'd like to also just emphasize, and I put my comments um, in the chat, um, just to focus on direct grants, as was mentioned before, no reimbursement grants. These communities and populations do not have the ability to pay upfront and be reimbursed. They really, there need to, there need to be planning phase grants and implementation phase grants. Um, they need access to capital. We need to really, really work with these communities that may not qualify for other traditional, you know, capital opportunities, um, you know, loans, venture capital, all this kind of stuff, because that's how they've been taken advantage of. And they end up being a license holder on a license, you know, underneath basic, basically ownership of, you know, some old white male owned company or something like that. So it's just very much needs to be, I think there does need to be that ownership uh, percentage requirement. Um, I don't know what that looks like. Um, expedited expungements to make sure that those affected directly by the drug war have access. Um, business and skills training and education, as Manny stated and emphasized very, very heavily, this is one of the biggest 
burdens and barriers to entry along with access to capital. Um, so those are kind of my biggest notes and takeaways and I appreciate the time. Sorry, I was trying to be as concise there as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate appreciate your comments. And then if you are also interested in um, speaking with me further, I, I would be happy to set up a, a one on one uh, interview with you. I would be honored. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and move to Natasha. Hi, my name is Dr. Natasha Kaloub, and um, as Amy Lyle can attest to, I've been involved in the cannabis program here in the county since day one, and I have, um, am fortunate and unfortunate to be a license holder. Um, at the end of this year, I may no longer be a license holder. I'm attending this meeting and on this call because it's not so much for my own welfare that I'm concerned about, but it's the welfare for the communities that have been impacted most. And it seems like a lot of pressure is being applied to um, broaden the inclusivity of who these, these, this funding is um, available for. And I would just like to emphasize the need for public outreach and education because though I was able to get through and become licensed, um, I'll be very teetering, um, it's a very difficult process. And there's a lot of us for different reasons, whether it's um, we have relatives or so forth, immigration status, so forth, like we need to be able to have the resources available to us to navigate the system and who's currently left in the pond are those folks that are able to navigate the system. And so many of us cannot. And so we need you guys to actually be available in a way that makes us have access to the resources that are often not so much available to us. So I just wanna emphasize that it's been mentioned, um, but I, I also would like to also just second to not broaden the inclusive, inclusivity but really cone in because there's so few of us minority applicants and license holders in this county and we're the ones that are teetering on the brink of extinction and we really need the support at this time thank you thank you natasha all right next will be dustin hi uh <clears throat> my name is dustin gibbons uh, I am a, on the uh, executive committee of the Hessels Farmers Grange and on the board of Sonoma County Cultivation or Sonoma County Cannabis Alliance. Um, and yeah, I just would like to go over a few things. Um, you know, first, uh, the types of grants, right? Uh, a few people have that uh, said a lot of the same things that uh, that I feel right. Um, the the idea of loans. Uh, is going to be an unsuccessful program, right? Uh, direct grants are are really the way, um, you know, especially for operators that are already operating. Um, they have so many needs and are, you know, um, really just getting behind further and further, right? Uh, mostly, you know, like uh, legacy uh, self-funded operators. Right, people that have been doing this for a long time, where where the the bank of knowledge comes from, right? The experience. Um, if Santa Rosa is going to have a, a successful cannabis program in the future, right, it needs to include these people. Um, and so, yeah, you know, just want to reiterate, reiterate uh, what some of my colleagues have said as far as direct grants and not loans. Um, and as far as use of those direct grant funds, you know, I would like to see us be able to, you know, everybody's got their own situation, right? Their own uh, place where they need to allocate those funds. Uh, I think it should be, you know, we should be able to use them to get caught up on taxes, right? Uh, either uh, or, uh, you know, license fees. Um, also facility improvements um equipment purchases you know where all operators well not all but you know sonoma county and santa rosa especially 
does have a lot of legacy operators that are bootstrapped, right? That have built their own facilities or they were part of penalty relief and they had facilities and, you know, got them online and licensed. Um, and then of those, you know, a lot of uh, applicants still need to get their annual licenses. So uh, if we can use those funds to, you know, find a pathway to annual licensure, um, whether it's through, you know, what, whatever the hurdle is, whether it's CEQA or, um, you know, any of the myriad of problems we face. Um, and, you know, I just uh, also wanted to speak on the goals of the program. Uh, I urge you guys to, you know, be more focused on existing operators, helping, you know, helping uh, get them where they need to be, right, which is successful and able to, you know, shore up an actual cannabis program and pay taxes and, you know, have this uh, successful program. Um, you know, those people, they've already been invested in the community, into the program through all of their time, all of the consultants, all of the local contractors we've worked with, you know, to we've, we've more than invested in the, in the city. And so uh, I would definitely like to see them taken care of, um, you know, and yeah, just those in, impacted by the failed pay, cannabis policies that we've had so far, right? Whether that's uh, local, county, or state or federal, right? Um, and then uh, as far as qualifications for applicants, you know, I, I, I see where you guys are coming from with the residency, but I don't really know if I agree with it. Um, I think more so it should be, you know, businesses that are in the city of Santa Rosa, right? I mean, that's where, that's the only businesses you're gonna be able to apply the grants to anyway. I believe. Um, and so businesses in the city of Santa Rosa um, and uh, so prior cannabis arrests, right? I feel as uh, either either by the, you know, for the operator themselves or, you know, family, right? Household, um, because that, that's like acutely impacted by the war on drugs, right? And by the, by cannabis policy in California. Um, and then also, uh, you know, another, you know, it, it, although also like equity status in another county, right? If they've come here from another county or if they've uh, been, you know, already, vetted right by other counties um you know specifically like uh you know mendocino county right they have a lead program they have um and, and you know it's also you know um i would urge you guys to just look at other counties and the you know speak with these other guys um i know i don't know what your access to these other counties is but, um, you know, to reach out to Origins Council, um, you know, we have, but there's seven, eight legacy producing regions uh, that are represented by Origins Council. Um, they'd be happy to put you guys in touch with other programs that are, you know, successful. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's really all I had to, uh, to bring up. Um, I appreciate you guys for giving us this uh, platform and for, you know, like Sam says, putting so much thought into it. It uh, it does seem like it has been thoughtful so far and uh, I hope to keep it that way. Thank you, Dustin. I appreciate your comments. Okay, we're gonna go um, back to Christina and Moses. Hello. Can you hear me? We yes. can hear you. I guess I, I just wanted to add, like, uh, I, I, I believe all of us can tell you how, what a beautiful job you guys are doing, right? And how wonderful it is. This feels like, to me as a Black person, it almost feels like reparation and daylight. You see what I'm saying? Just because we've been, 
operating for a long time and dealing with the county as well. You see what I'm saying? And the county, McCall and everybody specifically told us we weren't invited in that in those in that piece of the pie, so to speak. So I think to see you guys actually build for because the majority of black and brown folks are here in Santa Rosa. You see what I'm saying? And and yes, Sonoma County, but it's important. We need people that are going to see this for what it is. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so it's important that we we separate from county, as we were told by county that, you know, you want to add on. Well, to our that? concern is just that the uh, demographics and the needs of Santa Rosa jurisdiction are just different from the needs of the county, and if that's going to water down or um, change the disbursement of funds away from the racial equity that we're pushing for because it is what we saw was you know the disparity is so huge there um then that's our our concern about joining together with the county thank you so much thank you moses thank you christina yeah thank you thank you okay we'll go on to manny Um, hi, I had, I had I had a couple questions. I, re I realized I forgot to ask uh, while I was on. Um, number one, um, I got on the call a little bit late, so I apologize. I did miss a couple things. Um, did uh, has it is has it been determined whether uh, you need to be a resident of the city of Santa Rosa or if the business needs to be in the city of Santa Rosa? Uh, no, that has not been determined been determined uh so so is that essentially when we finalize our equity assessment report we will make recommend policy recommendations to the city to inform the development of their programs so those decisions will come later down the road as the city decides when to develop their program okay okay thank you and then my other comment was that i've heard it come up a couple times and it's something that i'm dealing with now is a uh, penalty relief. Um, there is some people that are still on penalty relief. Um, myself, for example, I do have um, uh, a cultivation license that is in penalty relief. Um, when we first acquired this business and this license, um, we didn't even know what penalty relief was. Um, we didn't even, we weren't even told that it was in penalty relief. So we kind of um, inherited a, uh, you know, this huge problem, I guess. Um, and that was part of the learning curve that, uh, you know, uh, uh, affected us and something that I think happens to a lot of people when they're trying to purchase, um, you know, uh, or, you know, start businesses is, is, is knowing, um, you know, how to vet the actual property itself. Um, so we're currently still in penalty relief and there's a lot of pressure by um, the county and the city to uh, have our, uh, facility um, redone uh, to certain standards and just given the the state of um, the uh, the you know um, the industry over the last few years where we've had a, a, a you know somewhat of a collapse um, I know that a lot of uh, the operators who had plans to uh, to um, rebuild or um, uh, remodel uh, certain facilities they just haven't been able to because the, the you know we the, the income has not been there um so we've been more focused on just making sure we can try to pay our taxes and stay uh in, you know operable um so i think that that should be considered strongly since it's something that the city you know has a has a vested interest in accomplishing with the licensees is you know who is in penalty relief can some of these funds go to people who are in those penalty relief programs so that uh there could be a win-win situation there with um you know, um, the city or the county, whatever it is, um, and for the licensee themselves. And then um, lastly, um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, I think that might, I think I forgot what was going to be the third thing, but um, that, yeah, yeah. So I think, I think if it comes back to me, I'll, I'll raise my hand again, but I think that's it. That's it for now. Thanks, Manny. I just wanted to address that um, just because there are some differences in the county program and the program we have at the city of Santa Rosa. Mm -hmm. um, but the county program does have the penalty relief um, situation. And that was basically an ability for, 
for operators that were already in existence before the cannabis ordinance to continue mm -hmm. operating until there was Correct. a permit. And so we don't have that situation within the city limits. Got you. Um, and so I think what you're suggesting is that we, um, if we build a program, um, create an opportunity for those that are in the county's system who have been operating under that penalty relief program. Is that kind of what you're suggesting? Yeah. So for example, I'm a Roseland resident. I've been in Roseland for 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, but my, but my, my actual business is outside of the city of Santa Rosa. I have one business that I've been working on um, struggling to get going. I don't know if I'm going to be able to complete that program or that, that business itself that's in, in Santa Rosa um, in the city, but my license, um, my cultivation license is outside the city. So, um, you know, that's why I was trying to figure out, and you answered that question, you haven't figured out which, how the requirements are going to go. But uh, for me personally, being a resident of Roseland, um, which is now annexed into the city, which wasn't before. Mm -hmm. um, so it's now that's changed for me personally. Um, you know, I would advocate for myself personally um, to be able to have access to those funds so that I can stay in business because my cultivation license affects the other businesses, the other business that I'm trying to open, you know, so um, they're, they, they work hand in hand, right? So um, that's why I was asking which, uh, if you guys had determined that, but you guys said you haven't determined that yet. So, um, you know, obviously if I'm given the opportunity to put my input into this process, then I would advocate for, for that. Great. Thanks, Manny. Thank you. And then it looks like we have a comment from Erica in the chat. She's unable to share her comment verbally, so she wanted me to read it. Uh, so I'll go ahead and read that. So Erica says, I'd like to add that I would like to see the current operators slash applicants most negatively affected by the war on drugs to be given the highest prior priority and a next tier focused on long-term operators. With that said, an overarching umbrella that any individuals who are able to gain assistance should have been a resident of our county, if not city, for at least 10 years in currently residing here, not just a business. Thank you, Erica, for your comments. And Manny, uh, you have your hand raised again. You should be able to uh, go ahead and comment. Yes, uh, so I, I remember what I was gonna say. So I wanted to encourage you, there is some equity programs um, that have been in existence for a while. Um, and some of those have been complete failures. Um, for, for example, um, and I don't know if this has changed, but in the city of San Francisco, when the equity program first rolled out, um, there was a lot of operators who were finding people, minorities or whoever, who had previous convictions, um, uh, cannabis convictions or whatever, and had been affected on the, with the, uh, uh, by the war on drugs. And they were having these people apply. They were being fast-tracked. And then, you know, six months, a year later, these applicants were bought out of the license or kicked out of the license and uh they actually weren't even able to participate um in the process itself or to benefit or profit from um being on those applications so um you know if given a chance if you guys have the opportunity to kind of look at what have been some of the failures in the past i would encourage you to do that as well absolutely thank you for that comment manny and that's something you know we'll we'll take a look at in our assessment report and you know we are aware of you know the applicants that were taking advantage in in San Francisco and that's kind of where the owner share ownership share percentage comes in you know what does that look like should an equity applicant maintain 51% ownership to prevent that exploit exploit toy excuse me exploitation and then, you know, other cities such as Long Beach, Beach have, um, and I think San Francisco now have put limitations on, um, you know, five, 10 years before an equity um, license can be transferred or so, sold, where other cities have, 
made it to where you can only sell your license to another equity applicant to keep those licenses in the hands of equity applicants. So very, very good point there. And we'll, we'll take a look at that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and consider, yeah, there's, you know, there's gotta be a way to be considerate of people's uh, percentage of ownerships. Maybe if there was, you know, a rule where you, you couldn't just be kicked off and you had to maintain, but I know of several companies where there is, you know, it's extremely difficult to have a company by yourself or just with one other person um, to have 51% would give you control of the company, which is often difficult. Um, you know, I know people who have uh, five owners and their ownership percentages are 20, 20, 20, 20. So it would be, um, you know, important to consider, you know, what people have um, and, not disqualify somebody who doesn't have a 51% ownership of the company, even though it's um, the intention is good. Um, you know, some people, you know, have struggled tremendously to even have a 5% or a 10%, uh, let alone 51% of a company. Um, so it'd be, um, I think it'd be important to consider that to not take that opportunity away for people who have less equity um, in their business. Good point. Thank you, Manny. Okay, thanks guys. Kyle, we have uh, no other hands raised um, at the moment. Okay. I think we'll wait a few more minutes to see if we get any questions to the chat or any hands raised. And then if not, we will end the meeting tonight. Um, but I just, I guess I'll speak now and I just want to thank everyone for showing up tonight and participating in this meeting. I want to thank everyone that raised their hands. Oh, we've got Natasha. Kyle, uh, can you just put on the last slide where we have my email and our city Oh, email? yes. Great, thank you. All right, go ahead, Natasha. Hello? Can you hear me? We can hear you. <clears throat> well, I'm not Natasha. Uh, can you hear that? Yes, um, the hand is raised under her name, but you can go ahead and speak. Oh, okay. My name is Omar Malfavon. I've been uh, involved in community building in Sonoma County, original native from Boonville, Mendocino County. And uh, we do a lot of work with community radio station, KBF, which is actually celebrating its 50th year anniversary this year. And I just want to know, like, the outreach pattern that you guys are using to get be more inclusive and, and integrate the people that are victims of the war on drugs. What what's that look like, and how are how is this effort being held accountable for making sure all voices are heard? And I think that's my biggest concern here when it comes down to who's going to get the benefits. Do we all look for a medium, a healthy medium, where people are listened to and heard? You know, because I think. It's easy to have Zoom and be able to get on a call, but it's really hard to be, you know, a, a farmer who put everything on the line to feed their families and not even have a chance to speak, you know? So I just, I think that's my question. How do you guys, when, when you make that decision, if you have to be a Roseland or Santa Rosa uh, native, what's gonna make that happen? And what are the mediums? Are the, did you guys reach out to KBVF? Have you guys reached out to, what organizations involved in equity programs for other, you know, annexation or uh, unincorporated areas have you guys utilized? That's my question. Yeah, so thank you for those comments um, and questions. Uh, so, so far, you know, we, we put out the uh, online survey. Uh, so the city sent that through an email blast to current and prospective operators within the city. Um, that was also advertised through the city's uh, newsletter and um, advertised through the city's social media accounts. Um, as I mentioned previously, we are also following this meet, following up this meeting with one-on-one -on -one stakeholders. Um, so as the word spreads, um, we're happy to um, set up 
uh, one-on-one -on -one interviews to get more of those personal experiences um, to include and incorporate um, that into our assessment report. And um, and the efforts, are there other local counties that you guys are following their model so we can study and look forward to their results? So when we, it, it affects Sonoma County, we know what to expect? Um, so currently the city has not begun to formulate their eligibility criteria. Um, our assessment report will pro provide recommendations. It will provide analysis of other equity programs in other counties, other cities, what they have done, what has worked, what has not worked in order for the city to have uh, you know, enough information and sound policy recommendations to develop their criteria, develop their program, develop the services and the benefits that their program will provide. So is there like a like a public, you know, like Santa Rosa, you see the little green dots on your guys' map was mostly affected in Roseland. Well, KVF, it happens to be in Roseland. I'm just wondering if we could do this publicly in an open table at a community hour that everybody can participate, come in person and participate at a radio station. Would the city of Sonoma County equity program be open to that maybe? That would be wonderful if you're able to help us do that. We're, um, we'd be happy to participate. We're very early in the process. We're looking for feedback. So um, anything you can do to help us would be fantastic. I will definitely reach out and let's make that happen. Great. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands raised at this time. Um, so on this slide, I have some contact information. Uh, so if you have any questions regarding the cannabis equity assessment, um, please feel free, free to reach out to Monet. Um, her email address is provided on the slide. And maybe, Monet, you can uh, provide that in the chat as well. And then if you have just general cannabis program questions, uh, feel free to email the city at uh, cannabis at srcity.org. Thank you, Kyle. We are getting some uh, more hands raised here. So we're okay. going to start with Bobby. I've given you permission to unmute your microphone. Bobby, go ahead. Hi, my name is Bobby Hughes. Um, I'm the owner of NC or one of the owners of NCM Corp. Uh, we DBA as SOG Army. Um, we've, we've qualified for like equity uh, because we've been affected by the war on drugs. We are, we all mostly have done prison time for cannabis related charges uh, for cultivation or possession. And with the city, I, I, I'm just now learning of this from my other operators that I'm friends with. And um, would you guys be considering maybe deferring fees for us or like giving us some kind of assistance the same way that the state does? Or um, who could we talk to if we already, um, you know, qualify for the $10,000 tax credit that's going to come out this year in 2023 and then we're already receiving uh you know like uh equity license application so it's free or whatever yeah so bobby um you know one you know our report will include a variety of recommendations one of that being fee deferral or even fee waivers a lot of equity programs that have been de developed elsewhere in various cities and counties within California have provided um, that as a benefit to equity applicants. Um, so that that is something the city will have to consider uh, once they develop their equity program. Gotcha. Thank you guys for considering this. I think it's really great. Thank you, Bobby. Okay, thank you. And uh, we'll go back to Christina and Moses. Go ahead. I apologize to... Uh inject one more time, but uh, um, I guess in, in, in terms of, I wanted to see what, what are the chances and possibility of utilizing actual local people in this study and getting this thing right, instead of hiring outside input, like you see what I'm saying? Is there, is it possible that we could work with folks on this platform to, to figure this whole thing out? You know what I mean? From Omar to Sam to, uh, 
Natasha and everybody, you know what I'm saying? Everyone to Lisa, everyone that's been on here. And I know we have great experience locally. So I, I just wanted to encourage you guys to first look within, you know, mm -hmm. especially the uh, blacks and the brown folks in on, on here. Like, I feel like it might be, and if there's money to give out to, to anybody, I think they should stay here, even in the little that you guys have in doing this assessment. You see what I mean? And if we could speed this thing up so we save farmers from losing their, uh, you know, if we could speed it up and get this money faster, it would definitely help our whole community here in Sonoma County and beyond, you know? Absolutely. And Moses, I will be reaching out to you to get your voice. And then, you know, I've written down contact information from others who have spoken already and that are interested in providing their, their input because definitely having that local perspective is what we're looking for. Yeah, I appreciate uh, that. Thank you again. Thank you, Moses. Okay, um, so I'm not seeing any other hands raised. Um, so we'll wait a couple more minutes and then we'll end the meeting. But again, thank you everyone for your participation tonight. And I remember I just saw a question about if the uh, PowerPoint tonight will be also posted on our website and we can do that also. We can post the PowerPoint on our website and the meeting tonight will be also posted on Equity Cannabis page. Thank you, Monet. All right, so I'm not seeing any other questions come through. But again, feel free to reach out to Monet um, if you have any additional questions. And I just want to, again, thank everyone for coming, and I hope everyone has a good night. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night.